The following interview was conducted with Michael Burke for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, September the 26th, 2007, in the TV studio at Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the oral history librarian. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about your early years and your family and siblings and were early years in school. Well, thank you, Carolyn. Uh, I grew up on a small farm in uh, west central Indiana, outside the town of Clinton, which is not a very big town. Not very far from uh, the state line, Illinois, and about in the middle of the state, north and south. Uh, my dad was a rural mail carrier and supplemented uh, what through that time was a pretty meager salary by uh, raising vegetables and uh, corn and a few other things and chickens. That's how I learned how to hate chickens. <laughs> uh, and. Uh, you didn't see that uh, program on 60 Minutes on Tyson. I don't buy Tyson. I did not. <laughs> I did not see that. <laughs> um, I uh, was a uh, was. I had two things that I really wanted uh, in life as growing up as a kid. One was to uh, go to college. There was no question that that was in the offing. Although we had five kids in a family, and on a mail carrier's family or salary, that was pretty. Uh, far, uh, far reaching aspiration, but uh, it was one of those things that uh, my parents, my mother was a college graduate, my dad not, uh, saw to. They were going to make that happen no matter what. Uh, so one aspiration was to go to, to, go to college. Uh, the other was to play baseball. And I was, until I was a senior here, my, uh, my real aspiration was to be a professional baseball player. I learned some things while I was here that made that a little bit unlikely, but uh, we had, uh, um, I think, a good, solid family foundation. As I say, I was, there were five children, I was the oldest, and all five of those children graduated from college, which says a lot. Um, that's, uh, that coin sort of gets the background uh, up to the time that I came to Purdue, and I enrolled here in the fall of 1956, so that's a long time ago. Tell us when you were born, and also was the school that you went to grade school, was it a small school, and uh, what was it like going to school? Well, I was born in Missoula, Montana, <laughs> and, uh, and grew up uh, from the age of eight on in this town, small town called, uh, by the name of Clinton, Indiana, uh, or near, near Clinton, Indiana. Uh, I was, uh, uh, I attended, during, fr from third grade on, all grades in the same building. Yes, it was a very small school. And uh, my graduating class from, it was Hillsdale High School, long since consolidated. But uh, my graduating class uh, comprised 11, eight boys and three girls. And then we came to a college. Was yes, very large. there were more people <laughs> in my freshman class by a factor of 10 than there were in my hometown. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was a bit of a change. How did you happen to select, did, uh, you select Purdue? How did you happen to come here? Uh, Purdue was a land-grant institution, is a land-grant institution, as you know. And that made it affordable for somebody who didn't have much in the way of resources. I think, as I recall, my uh, tuition in 1956 was $112.50 a semester. And room and board, uh, I worked. Uh, I worked in a, uh, a root beer stand called the Dog and Suds, in fact managed it for a couple of years, and each of my brothers in succession did as well. And um, I uh, uh, served as a, royal, a substitute royal mail carrier for my dad uh, in the summers when he would take some time off and uh, earned enough money with an academic scholarship here to pay my way. And uh, each of the kids thereafter did the same sort of thing. Uh, they found a way. Uh, it was Now, why Purdue? Well, I love technology. Uh, I didn't necessarily know what it was, but I, I liked things technical and I liked mathematics. I had a pretty influential math and uh, science teacher in high school. Same guy taught more than one thing. And um, uh, he sort of orchestrated my interest in uh, technology, or at least in things technical and in science. And um, when it came time for me to make a decision as to where I was going to go to school, 
uh, because of finances, there were only a, a limited number of choices, the state schools. And uh, Purdue was by far the best technically and uh, one of the best decisions I ever made. Yeah. Sounds to me like you might have enjoyed erector sets if you liked uh, as a child growing I up. I did, and my chemistry brother, sets too. My brother was, uh, was very big on those. And the, and the Lincoln Logs was another thing that he really liked. Yeah, I don't remember having Lincoln Logs. Our kids did. Sure. But I do remember erector sets and I remember chemistry sets. Yeah. Then I came here and decided chemistry isn't what I wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what was college like when you were here? Did, and you lived, did you live in a dorm all the time? I, I lived in a dorm. I lived in Cary Hall, uh -huh. Cary Quad, for two years. And then a brand new hall, uh, residence hall, opened, now known as Wiley Hall. But at that time, it was just called H3. Okay. And uh, so I moved over there. So all four years. I worked in the, uh, in the cafeteria uh, as a waiter and waiter captain eventually in uh, both places. Okay. Were any clubs and activities? What about the athletics? Was uh, that must have been one thing too with the baseball? Uh, it was a little tough. Oh. Spring semester uh, was a uh, one of those things where you don't sleep a whole lot, but um, it worked out. And uh, and as things moved on, and I I started with a pretty modest scholarship, but uh, then after my freshman year, was awarded another one uh, that was uh, paid twice as much. So it paid more than just tuition and some of the room and board. Oh, that's good. Um, and uh, and so it wasn't it wasn't necessary that I forego baseball in order to uh, stay here. Okay. And you played it. Did they were most of the games here, or did they do any traveling? Oh, we traveled. Yes, to Minnesota, what was that? And Ohio what was that State. Like buses or uh, mostly buses, but occasionally on uh, a DC three, the old <laughs> Purdue Air Force. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> what was Chauncey Village like when you were here during your college days, Chauncey Village? I imagine Harry's was here, though. Harry's was here, but I don't think, well, the, Chauncey Village was not there. Oh. There was a, um, a pizza joint at the time called Bruno's, and I think oh, okay. Bruno may still be around, but I don't think it's a pizza place anymore. Uh, Harry's was there, and uh, honestly, I never visited Harry's until I was a senior. Never was in there. And you were, I now I get over there every time I'm done. <laughs> Good for you. For a little bit. We're, we're alumni, right? Yes. <laughs> And then your career path afterwards. Tell us a little bit about when that. When I left, uh, when I graduated from Purdue, I, by that way. time, I decided that there were a lot of guys better base, at baseball than me, and that I probably wasn't going to be able to make much of a living doing that. Uh, and I had, um, had replaced, uh, uh, not the love of, of baseball, but, the, uh, but its uh, priority with uh, a lady, a young lady, who... Uh, I wanted to uh, get married to, and uh, also... You met here at Purdue? No. Oh. Well, n I was here at Purdue. Uh -huh. She was in nursing school at, uh, in Terre Haute, which, and in Indiana State, okay. uh, and my sister was as well, and that's how I met her. Uh -huh. We just celebrated our 47th anniversary, so it worked. Very good, yeah. Um, and uh, when, um, when I graduated, uh, knowing that I wasn't going to play baseball uh, for a living, I decided I very much wanted to go to graduate school. And, uh, and doing that and getting married were probably not likely, both of those things, until uh, Bell Telephone Laboratories came along and, and offered me a job and the opportunity to go to graduate school, and they would pay the tuition to graduate school at New York University. So I did that. I uh, studied electrical engineering there as well as here. Um, we got married and we moved to New Jersey. Uh, that was our honeymoon, and uh, we, uh, I, I was at Bell Laboratories for six years. Um, all three of our kids were born there, and uh, I did get a master's degree in electrical engineering, and eventually left more or less to start, not start a company, but to start an R&D facility for an existing company, but a very small private company. Mm -hmm. Um, I was there for three years, and that company was sold, as happens a lot of times in those sorts of things. Uh, I then ended up as director of engineering at another private company, a uh, company by the name of Westcom, in Downers Grove, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. And uh, after seven years there, uh, two other guys and I decided we ought to try it on our own and see if we could make it go. And our oldest son was in eighth grade at that time, and I remember thinking, and in fact discussing with Kay, uh, it's, it's worth trying because if it doesn't work, we'll know after four years 
when he's ready to go to college and I'll get a decent, honest job somewhere and he can go to school. And, um, and it turned out he came down here and, and studied sure. uh, management here at Purdue. Okay. And that's how the company you started? That's the how the company was founded uh, and started. The company's uh, name was Telebs. Mm -hmm. And um, it's now in its 37th year. And uh, no, I'm sorry, 32nd year. And still, still going strong. Still We're a public perfect. company. Yeah, very good. That's yeah. nice. Let's talk a little bit about the Board of Trustees. You were appointed as the replacement for Bob Jesse in 1999. And a couple of, there's some things that say one is capital improvement. That's something that you're involved, that the yes. trustees are involved in. So we might address that. Uh, the capital improvements here at Purdue? Well, that came, uh, th there were several of those. I uh -huh. think the first of consequence was the golf course. Okay. And, um, and I had gotten to know Morgan Burke pretty well. And uh, I uh, had forsaken baseball, f f well, initially for tennis. And then when that got to be uh, too painful, <laughs> I uh, forsook that for golf. And so I, I like to play golf. And uh, when, uh, when Morgan said, uh, we're seriously thinking about doing a significant upgrade on the golf course, and we've hired um, a, uh, it turned out a crusty old guy to, of, to be the architect for that sort of thing, uh, Pete Dye. I don't know if you ever met him, but I've he's an interesting character. Yes, I've heard um, and read things about him. And uh, would you be interested in helping us out? And uh, one thing led to another, and finally I said yes. I think that was the first of the, um, of the things that we did, mm -hmm. major things. I'd always been a member of the Alumni Association, President's Council for a long, long time. Uh, had a few uh, scholarships and fellowships that we funded um, and, and have continued to do that sort of thing as well. But uh, that was, that golf course was the first thing and I always kind of like to drive by there and see Burke Watermaker Golf Complex, it looks, it's very and, I, and, and our kids do too, and two of them graduated from here. Okay. Um, and then the next uh, step in the process was the big one, and that was, of course, the Nanotechnology Technology Center. Right. Okay. Uh, and the reasoning there was that if Purdue uh, were going to be a, a major player in technology, particularly, um, there had to be a nano component to that. Just the way the future is going to shape up, it seems to me. So by that time, Martin Jiske was here, and he had some pretty grandiose plans. And as a trustee, uh, I was help. I helped in in uh, orchestrate some of orchestrating some of those kinds of things. And uh, the result of it uh, eventually was uh, the Nanotechnology Center, which. Uh, I'm also very proud to see when I drive sure. by there. Oh yes, it's very nice. Well, some of the other, well, a couple other things that uh, the trustees are involved. In. One is the operating budget. You people are involved with with that as well for the university, and you work pretty closely with the administration on that, right? The operating budget. Uh, yes, yeah. we do. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's just what trustees do. Right. <laughs> that's right. one of the major. Sure responsibilities a trustee has is making sure that the, the university is adequately funded and and identifies its priorities adequately and properly mm -hmm. and provides the resources to support those priorities. Right. And for researchers you're elaborating which helps them when they uh, so they understand some of the workings that trustees are involved in one of which is the budget. That's an important part of it. Right, yeah. Now I would have to say though that uh, that the the, the real work on putting together the budget falls under the responsibility of the Vice sure. President of Finance, right. and that's Morgan Olson. Right. Uh, they, um, they have an awful lot of, of work invested in any budget we come up with. Right, I'm sure. When, and, and you're also the Board of Trustees for ratification of, an appoint, of the appointments of deans, the provosts, and distinguished profs. Those yes. appointments come, come before the board too as well. They do. Mm -hmm. And uh, those are important responsibilities, right. um, and and increasingly so, and, and especially so with provost and and chief, the, the top academic people. Um, after all, that's what this place is all about. That's right, exactly. And so that's that, that's an important element in things. Um, but obviously, the biggest responsibility I think of the trustees, just as the biggest responsibility of directors in a public company 
is picking out the uh, person to lead that organization. Yes. Well, we could, we'll move on in a second, but a couple other things that, you know, student trustee, you've got the student trustee and you work with, with that, which has been on the board since 75, if yes. I'm not mistaken. And, We've, and, and during input. my course, I think there have been four, and I believe we now just have, Jill is I think the fifth yes. of uh -huh. the student trustees. Mm -hmm. Without exception, they have been remarkable young people. Um, uh, the first one I met when I first, and I didn't actually know that trustees, that among the board of trustees was a student, and that student trustee had all the rights and privileges and responsibilities of every other trustee. And the young lady who, um, who, as a matter of fact, showed up the first day, the day I did. Uh, she had just been appointed? She was just freshly appointed. Okay. Her name was Amanda Teeter. She was from West Lafayette. Okay. Just a, a remarkable young lady, and they have all of them been since that time. Mm -hmm. I have no reason to believe that Jill won't be the same. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> well, um, also, tuition and diversity, these are two other areas that uh, people that the trustees are involved in. Yes, um, and uh, let me take the, the, the uh, tuition side of things first. That's always an issue because what it, what it implies is that um, people are going to have to make choices and prioritize their expenditures when they choose right. to send a child here. Right. Um, and, and as you know, there, have been, there has been some controversy from time to time about sure. uh, how the trustees or how the university has, has dealt with tuition. It's never come down as far as I'm aware. Uh, it, it goes up um, just like almost every other cost that you can think of. Right. And, and part of that comes from um, a deliberate effort to upgrade the university, to, bring, to make it more relevant to today's society, to make it um, a, a, more, uh, a more enriching place for students. And that means a broader selection of courses, um, much more laboratory experience for science and technology uh, students, uh, a, a much broader array of choices available to any student. And um, all of that comes with a cost. Right. And, and you don't do that without attracting people from academia outside Indiana and uh, Tippecanoe County. And to bring them here is expensive. Um, they sometimes are pleasantly surprised when they get here to find that First of all, this is a first-rate institution, and secondly, it probably doesn't cost as much to live here as it does in a place where they came from. But that aside, you got to get them interested and get them here in the first place, and salaries. And retain them as well. And and absolutely. Um, so uh, compensation, and particularly for faculty, is a is a significant issue. Has been for some time, and definitely is right now. Mm -hmm. So the tuition issue, and and th there are only two real funding mechanisms for Purdue. One is tuition and the other is the state. Um, I think everybody is aware because the board and Dr. Jiski and, and Dr. Beering before him um, addressed the issue of state funding. Uh, the state isn't uh, the, the wealthiest state in the union by any means. And, and I think they do what they can do. I, I'm, I'm not critical of the state in its approach to funding education at, at the uh, state universities. But the fact is that that funding is, has not been maintained at the level that it was originally presumed it would be. And so uh, that money to make the university has the to. place that people want has to come from somewhere. Unfortunately, that source has predominantly been the parents of kids who come here. and. Um, the administrators throughout have been have been very concerned about that, very aware of what this means to a, a citizen of the state, and um, so they have been, I think, as cautious as they can be in uh, in recommending increases in tuition to the board, and the board has been uh, pretty reluctant to just take at face value what they hear from these folks. So the board does a fair amount of work. Uh, studying the budget, addressing the, the expense items, and, and hopefully husbanding the resources of the university and the state to, um, 
do what we can to keep mm -hmm. the lid on things. Mm -hmm. but, um, but if the state doesn't own up to its side of the bargain, and for six years or so, or seven, it has not, um, money's got to come from somewhere. That's right. It's a difficult. It's a. It's a hard call. It really is. Yep. Diversity is another issue that you, uh, you've mentioned. You, people they have a report every year, and that's increased uh, the diversity within the campus. Well, diversity is the other issue that you mentioned. And, right. Um, the, um, the the appeal of an education or a place like that, part of the appeal, is the exposure to right. diversity in ideas, and the whole range. And ways of living and and people, the whole gamut of things. Uh, that's part of the rich experience of a university the size of Purdue mm -hmm. and uh, and with the kind of makeup that we have. Mm -hmm. So that's another requirement that has to be preserved. And in addition, of course, um, the citizens of the state, all of them need access to higher education right. if they can if they're capable of absorbing what this place dishes out. Well, there are an awful lot of people that are, and uh, so helping those who have difficulty is essential. And, and I was certainly one of those back 40-some years ago. Uh, I uh, perhaps didn't appreciate it quite as much back then. I think maybe my parents did. <laughs> and, uh, and Quite often parents could pick that. Then as time goes on, you all, it all comes back to you. It does. Right. It does. Exactly. Right. And then um, intercollegiate athletics, of course, is another thing that the board is somewhat involved in. Well, so yes, that's, that's fun. They fund it's, it's they fund their own things. The athletics. They do yeah. uh, athletics at this university, different from almost all other universities, uh, is a separate expense item. And and uh, uh, I think that uh, that Morgan Ols or Morgan uh, Burke, who has been athletic director now, I think longer than any other AD in the Big Ten, Sounds has done a remarkable, jo remarkable job of, of making sure that the resources are there uh, in the prescribed way. And uh, uh, I played baseball here, as I mentioned, uh, so I know, I have a little experience with the athletic side of things, <laughs> an enormously enjoyable time too, I might add. Mm -hmm. um, one other of our trustees did as well, as you know, Tim McGinley. Uh -huh was a basketball, basketball player here, right. same yeah. time I was here, a couple of years behind me. And, um, and I think the, the trustees take very seriously the athletic heritage of this place. They're proud of it. They're proud of the fact that, that Purdue pretty much plays by the numbers. We, you don't hear major problems emerge uh, in the athletic program here as you do in many, many other places. We had one last year in the women's basketball program. Uh, very unusual and and very distressing. Uh, we talked about among the trustees. Uh, obviously, the athletic department had uh, issues to deal with there, and will have for a year or two. Sure, right. Uh, presidential search committee. That's one of the most important things, and you were a member of, of that. And as you addressed a few moments ago, selecting the CEO, selecting the CEO of a like company, company or the president of university. Right is perhaps the most significant responsibility of either the Board of Trustees or the Board of Directors. Um, yes, I've been involved in two of those uh, because... Oh, for Dr. Baring as well? Or no, for Dr. no. Dr. For Dr. Uh, Jeske? Dr. Jeske and okay. then now Dr. Cordova. Uh -huh. and, um, I, and I co-chaired the latter uh, with John Harden. It was a very enriching experience. It took a lot of time and uh, was sometimes frustrating, but it, it's another way of learning how diverse uh, this place is and, um, and the depth of feelings and emotions that people have for it. I got a lot of advice from a lot of people, not all of them directly involved with the university along the way, and I suspect that uh, John did and I think probably the others on the search committee did as well, and that's fine. Uh, I. I think that um, in the final analysis, we came out with the best choice we could have made. Now, it's only at the very embryo stages of uh, Dr. Cordova's uh, assignment here, but um, so far, so good, as far as I can see. Right. 
And I'm thinking as you're making the comments, one, keep in mind the researchers that can benefit by that and that but your point is it's one of the key things that the trustees are involved in is the selection of the president, which you've addressed. Well, it is the most important right. thing the trustees right. have to do. Right. And, uh, and, and they take that seriously. I can assure you that, uh, that the preparation for the search among the trustees was pretty elaborate. I was only here a year when we undertook that activity in, that resulted in uh, Martin Jiski. Uh, so I didn't, and I was, I was a, the new kid on the block. I wasn't uh, as involved in that process, obviously, as I was in this one that just completed. Um, it took us, well, a year and a half of, uh, of preparation and execution. Uh, it, it, the last six months by far were by far the most, uh, the busiest and, and the most stressful. But um, there are certain things that you, you have to do, and among those is make sure that everybody who is nominated, whether they place themselves in nomination or whether somebody else does, or whether you go and ask them, gets a fair shake. And, um, and that means that you have to talk to an awful lot of people. And, and a lot of the people involved first in the search committee and then the board of trustees had to do that, had to spend some time with each of those candidates. Not all 120 candidates or whatever was actually interviewed by the, either committee, either the trustees or the search committee, but a lot of them were. And, and there were among those 100 or so nominees, probably half that didn't fit and probably wouldn't have wanted it anyway. Right. Do you find that, do you think a search, um, a search firm which you've used as an additional asset, uh, that it's been mentioned in the news that you did have that? We did have a search. In fact, the well, same... The researchers who say, well, was, it, was there a need for that? That's why I raise that question. Well, uh, I think the answer is yes. Okay. Uh, there certainly was seven years ago, seven, a little over, eight years ago, say, when we were, when we entered the search for Dr. Chisky because it had been 17 years right. since any search had been undertaken and there was nobody on the board who had participated in that earlier one. So there was no experience. And uh, it's tough enough if you've been through it a time or two. If you haven't, it's perhaps impossible. Some guidance of some sort is essential. Yeah, right. Well, we, we hired a, uh, a search consultant uh, eight years ago and, uh, and I thought he served us well. Um, and, and not just because he can identify individuals and say, here is a list of people that you ought to go talk to, but because he can give you some insights into the process. Right. Not the only pr place you get those insights. But we'll provide that asset and that additional But he does resource. provide that and, and a regimentation of the process so that, you know, here's what you do first, here's what you do second, third, and so on. And uh, the second time around, there were several of us who had been through that process before. Um, but we hired the same guy, and partly because um, the committee at the early stages needed to be separated from the actual contacts and, um, and, and let the, the, the forces that, that operate in these areas uh, contact people, assess their interest, find out what their background is. There were certain things that we felt were absolute requirements, and there were some other things that, that we thought would be nice. One of the things we thought would be nice is someone who had been in that role somewhere else. There's nothing like experience. And as we found out in the, in the search committee, um, the, the essentials pretty much had, it had to be an earned doctorate. Uh, there had to be um, uh, some affiliation with research or science, technology, engineering, somehow because that's what this place is it all about. It fits in with the land grant mission. Yes, and and the familiarity with land grant was a, was an important element in all of that. Right. Yeah. Um, so, certain things come naturally, and certain things you learn. That's right. Exactly. Good point. Okay. Uh, strategic plan. You uh, any comment or general general comments on that? It's yes. Working very well. Uh, it it did work very well. Right. Uh, the board of trustees before I got involved with it. Had, um, had identified the need for an appraisal of Purdue. How good are we, or were we, uh, at that time, as a precursor to a presidential search? 
You may recall that, that Steve Bering, Dr. Bering, um, was asked to stay on for two years beyond his normal retirement age. Uh, and, and part of the reason for that was to uh, help establish a foundation for a search and for the university, identify what the needs were, um, and help, help construct some kind of a plan upon which the university could then go forward or the trustees could go forward representing the university. That worked out pretty well. Um, and it was a little bit of a start, a heads up. It was a little bit of a start. And the trustees, and, and I would have to identify uh, Tim McGinley as the guy who really was the, the um, instigator of, uh, of that process. Um, a lot of the constituencies were interviewed, uh, faculty and staff and alums and uh, business people in the state and agricultural people in the state. A lot of people contacted and said, what do you think Purdue ought to be? How, it ought, how ought it be uh, organized and, uh, and, and what, it, what should it do as the, in the future? One of the things, by the way, that came of that was a greater desire for engagement with the rest of the state, economically and in terms of, of being an integral part of what the state is all about. Uh, it had been that through the agricultural extension activities, but only there, uh, obviously, for the agricultural side of things. There's a lot more to the state than agriculture. Right. So uh, that, that was kind of the genesis of this strategic plan. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, when Martin got here, Martin Jiske, and put his team together, which included um, several new people, um, the, uh, the task was to, to define, to orchestrate a plan, put it together, uh, define the objectives and goals, and, uh, and the board and the administration and the faculty all worked together on that. It was uh, one of the more remarkable examples I've ever seen of buy-in by an entire community into a process that's pretty tough. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not the easiest thing in the world to do. That's right. And, uh, and that worked. And, and a five-year uh, plan was put in place with measurable, met, with metrics to, to measure the outcomes and peri periodic reviews by the board and by the administration and, um, and participation by everybody. And so nobody was told, you must go do this. People were told, we need a strategic plan. Help us define what that plan is. And I think the same process will be used this time. Okay. We need another one. We finished that one. Yep. And a big part of that, as you know, was the uh, campaign for Purdue. Right. And that, that capital campaign, that you were involved in that too. Oh yeah, I was right. involved in that. Were you involved both at, in, the East, at, in Chicago area as well as here? or uh, I, Only I because I was general? in the Chicago area, but there were, uh, Brian and Susan Erler were the, the Chicago people heading up the campaign up there. Did a great job. Uh -huh. I, uh, I helped them where I could. Yeah. You might, just for the researchers, just make a couple of observations about the campaign that, uh, that you'd care to share with somebody who's, I know you can look at a newspaper, but I'm thinking any comments that you, because you've been involved with it as, on the trustees as well, as a personal involvement. Yes, uh, with, with research? Yeah, with the, with the, board, the trustees, or just, just some general comments on the capital campaign oh. that you'd care to share with All us. All right. Well, uh, when this thing was originally announced, it was announced as a uh, $1.3 billion campaign, which at the time was far bigger than anything any university in the state had ever done. And, uh, and Martin Jiske asked me if I would chair the steering committee for this thing. <laughs> I, uh, at 1.3, right? <laughs> at 1.3. And uh, I said, well, uh, I'm still running a company and I'm, I'm not sure that that's the right thing for me to do, but okay, I'll do it. Um, and one of the uh, reasons for that was that uh, uh, the development office here had been substantially fortified. And Murray Blackwelder here. was aboard at that time. He would put together a pretty good team of people. Uh, and and I, I remember looking at the records in the development office for Vision 21, which was a another campaign that I did run for the Chicago portion of, um, a night and day difference. I mean, we didn't know back in the, in the early 90s anything at all about our alums. 
we didn't know where they were. We didn't have records of, of what they were doing. And uh, it, it's, you can't go and ask somebody for a substantial amount of money unless you know he's got it. <laughs> and so if you know nothing. You don't go knocking on the door. If you know nothing, you're in trouble. And that's kind of where we were. So Murray and his crew put together uh, an information system uh, for potential donors, and uh, that was an enormous help. Oh, and yeah. organized the campaign. Murray's a vet. He knows what, right. how, how to do these things. Been through it before. Uh, it was organized by constituencies and cities and so on, as you know. And, and those kind of things, all when you add them together, make for a successful campaign. I thought, I thought that 1.5 or 1.3 was uh, a real stretch. And then as we got, and we got into the thing, and I think four years into it, it was suggested that Murray knows what he's doing. He, he looked at the numbers and said, we're going to make that pretty easily. Maybe we ought to raise the bar a little. And so after some, some head some scratching, <laughs> yeah, we decided we'd do that, and we did. Uh, raise it to 1.5, and uh, actually came in at 1.7, which says a lot about this this place and the sure people does. that support it. It sure does, big time. That's wonderful. You know, um, the um, and the, you, you mentioned earlier about the you've been involved with the president's council. Yes. Uh, w um, w were you, that was started by Dr. Hansen. Did yes, you, it was. Did you uh, join? We been a member all that time yes. when he was here. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I was. It's really grown a lot, hasn't it? Oh, has it, yes. Has, it focused, has there been any change uh, within the council over time? Which I think? don't think so. Okay. I mean, the general focus is to raise money for the university, um, working through the Alumni Association, uh -huh. and, uh, and that's, it's, that's held pretty steady. Uh -huh. the, um, the President's Council was an enormous help in the campaign. Because you had a listing of people, and they've been somewhat involved, very involved in the university. They had been very involved. And a working list. And the leadership of the President's Council um, are some pretty astute folks mm -hmm. and uh, people you could go to for advice and uh, and a check once in a while. <laughs> uh, uh, family, uh, you, you're, you say you were married here, your, where your children went to Purdue? And... Two. We have three children. Okay. Uh, the two oldest came here. Our son uh, was first and he, uh, Kevin wasn't much uh, for technology and and went into uh, management Cranert okay. graduated from Cranert but our daughter was a great is is still quite a mathematician and uh, she uh, she came here uh, to be an electrical engineer and uh, graduated with honors and uh, and then uh, stayed here and got her master's degree met her husband here he got his PhD here in uh, uh, in uh, robotics and uh, now their oldest son, who's a senior in high school, and they live in, uh, in, the, in a suburb of Boston, uh, came here for a week this summer, this past summer, for Engineers Week, Engineering Camp. Right. And um, was really turned on by what he saw in the electrical engineering, or ECE, program. My hope is that he's, he's going to end up here. He's a really bright kid, uh -huh. straight A-plus student, and he's being, he's being sought by... Other places. Other places. Um, <laughs> Whose names will not be mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> right. Be something in the Northeast. But, well, he doesn't want to go to school in the East. Oh, okay. But Penn State's one of them. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I count that as East, but, right. but uh, Purdue may have, uh, may have the final say. Camps do tend to, you know, give a little yeah, enrichment in there, so that sounds okay. Uh, the... Um, Purdue Research Foundation, you serve on the board there still? Yes. Or are you still on the board with that as I well? I am. Okay. Is that a certain period of time, or how does that, for the, I'm thinking of the researchers, you get Those, appointed? You are appointed for three-year okay. uh, terms, and I have been on the thing, I think I'm in my third term there. Okay, okay. Alumni Association, you've been pretty involved in that. Tell us well, about Well, not as involved as some. Okay. Uh, I, um, uh, I have been, I am a life member of the Alumni Association, have been for a long time, uh -huh. um, but, uh, but I've never been on their board or an officer of the Alumni Association, except through being uh, the, one of the three Alumni Association representatives on the Board of Trustees. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, as you probably know, there are three 
three alumni right association of, trustees. Right. Do you, uh, t you go to in some of their functions, or are you active in, say, in the Illinois chapter, or? I, uh, I'm not as active in Illinois. I okay. sort of confine my activity to down here. I, yes, I do get involved in some of the things, particularly around uh, bowl trips and so on. <laughs> That's an activity we're all involved yes. in, I know. Now, couple, let's talk a little bit about some of your honors and awards. You got an honorary doctorate in, in 95. How did that come about? Did someone give you a call? Yes, Steve Beering. Oh, Steve. <laughs> well, when Steve calls, right? <laughs> yes. And uh, I, I had no clue that that was going to happen. Uh, it was uh, uh, obviously an enormous honor, and uh, and I was, uh, it was it was just wonderful. I uh, I will never forget that commencement. I've been to a lot of commencements. Never did go to one here because I graduated at the end of my uh, at the end of summer. Um, and they and didn't have graduation at that no, time. No, oh. they had a graduation. Uh, in January, but I was already working then, and so oh, okay. it wasn't uh, a pl thing to do. But uh, but none were quite like the one where you receive an honorary doctorate. That's uh, pretty pretty high praise from an institution that uh, you hold very dear. That's right. And you also were a D you got a DEA from the School of, of Engineering. Yes. Uh, and how did that come about? Uh, <laughs> another phone call. Uh, yes, um, it did. Um, <laughs> That was, I think, put uh, put in motion by Henry Yang when he was Dean of Engineering. Uh, if not he, yeah, I think it was Henry that was, was involved in that. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I've had a few uh, of these kind of things. That's nice. And you've been on the visiting committee as, as well. And a recent one, you just got that Washington Award from the Western Society of Engineers in yes. February. That's very nice. Thank you. That was that was quite a surprise also. I got a call from the president of the, uh, of the, the Western Society uh, last fall, I, about this time I think, and said you've been nominated to receive this award, the Washington Award. Um, and I said, what's that? <laughs> because uh, the, uh, the Western Society, I, I had known of them but as, as a civil engineering organization. Okay. And I hadn't kept track of things to know that they'd shifted their focus to a much broader engineering background and engineering approach. Uh, so, um, but a good friend of mine, a guy that you, that you mentioned previously by the name of Bob Jesse, was a, is a civil engineer. Right. And I knew that if, uh, if I got an award from a civil engineering organization, being a double E, he would, be, he would take great notice of that. He did. Um, and uh, so I, I originally said, well, you know, we spend our winters in uh, in um, Florida, and I don't. It's in February that this took place, and I said I don't know that we're going to be around then. So I did some homework. I I read up on the Washington Award to see who a little bit about it, right? Yeah, who right. who in the past has been a recipient of that award, and um, uh, what does the the uh, the uh, Western Society do these days? And after that. Um, he said, well, I'll call you back in a week. And uh, when he called back, I said, I'd be delighted. So it was uh, one of those uh, uh, learning experiences that uh, we all have. Where, where was it? Where, where was the ceremony? Where did you get, where did they give it to you? Was it, was at, um, it was at the uh, University Club in downtown Chicago. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. Jesse was there to, uh, he and, and Donna were there to, uh, uh, celebrate with us, and uh, a, a whole array of Purdue people came. Isn't that nice? It was just outstanding. Those are neat things, you know. They are. Yeah. You, you just, those are the kind of things that you can't put a value on. Right. It's, it never it's will. It really yeah. means a great deal. Right, yeah. Um, what's one of, got one of your longest memories of Purdue? You think of one of those or an outstanding event? I usually ask those for people. I, I, I guess maybe I would. I don't know it's a specific incident, I can think of some, but playing baseball here, playing varsity baseball at a Big Ten school, um, I never thought the, that would happen. Where was the field? Where did you play when you were here? Where the football practice field is now, where Malenkoff Center is, hmm. basically. It was oh, okay. just... Uh, just adjacent to that. That's yes, adjacent to the football stadium. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, uh, and I played with and against some guys that played professionally. <laughs> when I saw how good they were, <laughs> that I was, was glad, what convinced me. I was me. glad I had another option. <laughs> you bet. Um, but it was, it, it, 
I, a lot of memories are associated with that. But at the time, um, there was a there was a uh, curmudgeonly old guy by the name of Ray Shalk, Cracker Shalk, a Hall of Fame catcher for, for the Chicago White Sox, who was a the assistant coach here at Purdue. for the baseball team here at Purdue. I don't think they paid him. I think he just did it because he loved the game and liked kids. There are a lot of people like that. <laughs> yes, there are. Enjoy doing it. And and this and old Cracker was a a um, he was a mentor. Uh, I didn't know what what I was in for. I was when I made the freshman team and Piggy Lambert, by the way, was the coach of the freshman oh, okay. baseball team. Um, and uh, that's back in the days when freshmen didn't play varsity sports. So you had a freshman team and then sure. if you... Same was true with football yeah, as well. Right. And uh, I managed to uh, survive that transition and, and Ray Shaw kind of took me under his wing. I was a pitcher and he was a catcher and I guess there's always a little camaraderie there. Sure. Um, and Ray and, uh, and, and some others, but he and Piggy were, were uh, uh, role models for me. They were mentors um, and, and people I could go to if I, you know, you always go through times when you're down a little bit. Sure. When I thought, uh, I can't do this, I discovered by that time, by the time I was a sophomore, that I could do engineering. That, that is, I could do the schoolwork and, and so on. So that wasn't a challenge other than the time that baseball took. But um, it was tough. There were some very good athletes. And, uh, and yet, maybe a little bit because those guys, with those guys' help, I, uh, I played varsity baseball, lettered for three years. And, um, and I can recall a lot of things that uh, went along with that. But uh, the people that you meet, the friends you make, and I still see them. That's nice, yeah. I mentioned earlier about giving back. You, you really have, and you've enjoyed doing that. You mentioned about the golf and many of the things that you've done, um, the professorships and things, and the nanotechnology. It's mm -hmm. nice. It's wonderful. And uh, We just did one recently, you know, for we, the School of Nursing. Oh. My no, wife I, is a nurse. Oh, okay. And, uh, we, uh, and she didn't go to Purdue. As I mentioned, she went to Indiana State. But um, uh, when, uh, when George Goodwin, when, when Martin announced George Goodwin's, he was going to use some of George's bequest to the university to stimulate uh, uh, the uh, flow of um, money into the academic, the, the, fellow, or the uh, uh, funding chairs for the university. Um, Carolyn Gary said to me, she, and, and you know, she's had some involvement with the School of Nursing of late, and, uh, and she said, don't you think it would be a good idea uh, since you've now got a golf course and a, and a nanotechnology center named for you and some scholarships in the double E school and so on, that you would give some thought to uh, a different discipline and one that might honor your wife. And I said, you know, that's not a bad idea. So we did. And, and uh, this uh, uh, chair, this endowed chair in uh, nursing is in her name. That's very nice. You know, one of the quotes I've read, Mr. Uh, Mr. Burke, most of my activities have been devoted to education, and I think those things that you've addressed certainly represent that. Well, thank you. That's um, very nice. Education is, it's for me, quote. it was the way out of a very small town in Indiana, and I knew I wanted to get out of that. Um, and and it's, it is the, the, the path to success for anybody that is willing and able to address themselves to it. Right. Any questions that uh, you'd like to ask that weren't? If you think of anything in closing? You've been pretty thorough in well, your preparation my pleasure. on this it's been, thing. Um, and you've been very, and you keep very active, and you kept down here um, with the team, with the sports, and all the athletes. Oh, yeah. I, I have to ask you, you're talking about baseball. Do you support the Cubs or the uh, White Cubs. Sox? Cubs. Oh, I'm a Cub. I've been a Cub fan since 1946. Oh, okay. That's the year after the last time they were in a World <laughs> Series. We'll keep our fingers crossed this year. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, I think this closes. I want to thank you very much on behalf of the libraries. It's my pleasure. Well, and you're welcome. I hope this uh, is helpful to you. It very much so, and we will enjoy having it. All right. Yeah.